Hi, my name is Will Hall of Mormon, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to talk with Hedy Viterbo about his presentation on critical legal theory and childhood studies. So a number of questions started forming for me while listening to you speak, Hedy, and I'd like to start with one about agency. Um, one of the more striking examples in your talk for me was the case of the arrested youth protesters refusing to provide their ages in order to aid their legal processing into you know, children versus adults. So in the chapter that your talk draws upon, you describe this as an instance of quote unquote legal agency by young people, which we often overlook. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you think critical traditions in both legal theory and childhood studies could learn from each other and, you know, with respect to analyzing legal agency. Um, which is an important yet contested concept in both fields. So painting with a broad brush here, but you know, among the persistent objections that critical legal theory has faced since its early days is that in emphasizing the violent power of legal discourse and categorization, it implies a sort of pessimism about individual actors' capacity to meaningfully challenge and act outside of those ideological constraints. And then while agency has long been a central concept for scholars of childhood, writing about young people's resistance to social norms and oppression. It's also been the subject of substantial criti criticism by scholars who see it as privileging notions of you know, liberal autonomous selfhood, individualism um, in terms of action, and also perhaps overstating children's power to reshape the world around them. So you know, ultimately my question for you is, how do these fields offer guidance for each other and how we should be thinking about agency moving forward. And you know, also, if you care to talk about it, how have you thought about the concept in your own work? First of all, uh, great to be talking to you, Will. And uh, thanks for the question. I think you framed it very uh, helpfully. Um, maybe a starting point is just to remind ourselves that agency is a word. It's not something that necessarily objectively exists uh, in the world. So it's more, it's more a question of, how do we conceptualize agency as something that helps us make sense uh, of what's happening uh, around us and in the materials and in the context that we are uh, examining as uh, researchers? Um, and, and the question of agency is actually something I've discussed uh, uh, and considered quite extensively, including in light of the uh, criticisms uh, uh, you mentioned um, in my latest book, um, trying to grapple with some of the challenges around um, that uh, concept. So um, informed by these two fields of knowledge, both critical childhood studies and critical uh, uh, legal uh, theory, um, I would say, and, and that's something I've tried to, to um, explore in my work, I would say that it's helpful maybe to think about what agency is or can be and what how we should avoid thinking about agency. So for me, agency, social agency is about an instance where uh, a social actor establishes a certain uh, dynamic or interrupts it uh, or shapes it. So legal agency is exactly that in a legal context. It's, it's establishing or interrupting or um, influencing, uh, navigating, uh, negotiating a certain legal dynamic. Uh, and when I say legal, I'm very I'm, I'm conceptualizing this term very broadly. I think, as my uh, video um, indicates, the main point for me, which I tried to highlight in the video, uh, is that agency is also not necessarily about not just about the impact or the actions of the actor, but also about what issues and what social agents we as researchers find relevant uh, to our work. So if we're, and, and one of the points I make in the video is that when we think about social agents within childhood uh, studies, often we focus on the young people who are formally and, and quite often legally defined as children, or we discuss adults who have direct responsibility or, or relationship with those children. And that's a very, very narrow um, framing of the question of childhood and agency. If if we conceptualize uh, agency more broadly, um, we can bring uh, additional practices and instances into our uh, analysis. So that's a few thoughts about how we can think about agency, but I would also caution uh, against certain things that we should avoid. Uh, 
first of all, I would, uh, uh, in, in my own work, I've tried to avoid uh, conflating agency with intentionality. Um, for example, in, in, in the example that uh, uh, you mentioned in your question uh, of the uh, young people who refuse to um, disclose their ages, I'm not sure to what extent that act was a deliberate um, uh, attempt to um, obstruct the desire of the law to establish age norms. I'm not sure it was that. In, in that particular instance, it was more part of the just broader refusal to uh, collaborate with the legal system, which included a, a broad refusal to disclose any identifying uh, details. I just found that the refusal to reveal their ages was particularly challenging for a legal system, which is so fixated on ages, especially when it comes to uh, young people. So the question of intentionality for me is not that crucial. It's more about the effects, both symbolic and material, of the act, perhaps. Another point is that we should avoid conflating agency with speech. There's a tradition, quite an old tradition now, which I think has already been challenged, of conflating agency with speech and talking about silence in contexts mostly of disempowerment. So the silenced are the disempowered. And I think what, what we can see in, in this example and in, others, uh, in other contexts is that silence can actually be a very powerful form of agency. Sometimes we are, uh, there's a demand from the law for us to speak as legal subjects and the refusal to speak or the incapability in other cases to speak can also be a form of agency, whether deliberate or not. The final point I would make, which is also related to, to one of the challenges uh, uh, you mentioned, is that agency is not necessarily an indication of some authentic and knowable subject. And that's another point that I um, discuss in my work. Um, and there are various reasons for that. And both structuralist uh, literature, among others, has talked, uh, has, has kind of uh, uh, discussed extensively uh, and challenged the notion of uh, this uh, authentic self. But for me, one of the issues um, in a more practical uh, sense is that there's no self that's separate, that is separate from the messy social fabric. So whenever anyone is doing or saying anything, and that's also an important reminder for us as, researcher, as researchers, whenever someone, uh, an actor, does or says something, that is, among other things, uh, the result of external social influences. And that applies to both children and adults. It's not just about young people. Um, sometimes in human rights reports or uh, in, in studies, we quote children or adults as an indication of or a revelation of some authentic truth. And if we treat it more cautiously uh, and contextualize it uh, in that way, um, I think uh, we, we wouldn't jump to such uh, uh, conclusions about the self that is supposedly and the authentic truth that is supposedly revealed by uh, the agent, the social agent. So those are just a few thoughts about that. Thank you. That's that's super helpful. Um, you know, I was thinking about while you, while you were talking about how, you know, maybe the kind of critical legal tradition offers, um, you know, and, and it's it's perhaps pessimistic stance on some of this stuff offers like an entry point into these conversations about agency within, within childhood studies, in you know just kind of shifting away from this this way of thinking that that emphasizes like agency as argument like the fact that we can establish agency as being the end point of of a you know a scholarly uh, analysis rather than kind of the entry point into thinking about how it works um and you know it's tempting to do that because as you mentioned children are often denied agency you know in our accounts of mm -hmm. you know of, of how they operate in the world but I think this is a is a useful corrective to that, and it, and it kind of leads me into my next question, which is about you know the violence of childhood and dependency and and the law's role in that. So at at one point in your talk, you make what I think is a very important point, which is that part of what makes the violence of childhood and the law so effective is that it's normalized to the extent that it's not even perceived as violence. And you go on to say that the label of quote unquote child. 
perpetuates the presumed dependence and ignorance of the young by confining them within particular spaces and constraining their rights to participate in public life. And you also point out that it wasn't always this way. Um, Age-related rules and restrictions existed prior to the 20th century, of course, but they weren't nearly as widespread or enforced. So as, as a historian, you know, what I found noteworthy about the transition in the social category of childhood you're discussing is that many of the people in the past who drove the creation of you know, what some people call protected or sheltered childhood very much saw what they were doing as securing the rights of children to be educated rather than to work, to basic sustenance and medical care, to be free of sexual violence, et cetera. Um, so the legal theorist Annette Apple has called these sorts of obligations towards children dependency rights. And I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about how the ideas of critical legal theory and childhood studies can be put into conversation to illustrate the limitations of conceiving of children's rights primarily as dependency rights. So, you know, for example, a scholarship in critical and legal feminist, uh, feminist legal theory has done substantial work in denaturalizing the so-called public-private distinction in law and pointing to its role in sustaining gendered familiar relations. But children are often invisible in such accounts, or you know, they're only mentioned as, as the passive recipients of care. So, you know, ultimately, how can we write about children in a way that doesn't also engage in violence, that doesn't assume or reproduce the privatized status of childhood? Uh, thank you for that. That's a fantastic uh, set of questions. Um, I'll try to address uh, several themes. Uh, um, first of all, you you alluded to the question of uh, um, intentions and how well-meaning uh, many reforms historic historically uh, were and still are, uh, arguably. Um, I, I touched briefly uh, previously uh, on the question of uh, intentionality when I said that we, sh we should avoid uh, reducing agency to uh, intentionality. I would also say in this context, because it is part of what you're talking about, the question of whether all of this was well-meaning, maybe a couple of things. First of all, in my own work, I've, uh, I've argued uh, quite forcefully that we should not be tempted to analyze social and legal uh, phenomena based on intentions. Even though that could be tempting, it could seem to advance our analysis, that could be problematic to, to assume or to argue that there are certain intentions uh, behind certain uh, practices or discourses. That could be problematic for several reasons. First of all, analytically, um, a person's actions or what they say is not necessarily indicative of their intentions, either because they could be lying to us or because they could be lying to themselves uh, or for other reasons. Also, epistemologically, some, sometimes people act and they don't have clear intentions. They're just operating on autopilot. Uh, and even normatively, there are some instances where if we focus on intentions, which is kind of a legal way of thinking about certain acts, right? Because in the crime, when you think about crimes, it's not just about the act, it's also about the intention quite often. But from a normative perspective, if we uh, focus on intentions, that allows the actor to get away with it if they argue that what they were doing was simply unintentional, which states, violent states, for example, quite often do. They say, maybe we killed all these innocent people, but that was uh, an unintended uh, um, consequence. So I think for all of these reasons, um, we could talk about intentions, uh, but I think we should be careful about what space that occupies within our research and analysis. At the same time, as you rightly note, intentions as, as an appearance, as a discursive element, set, is certainly something that child law and child rights derive a lot of their power from, from the assumption uh, that they are very well-meaning. So it's not that intentions are irrelevant, it's more about um, how we think about them. You also talked about um, the privatized status of childhood. Um, I would say that childhood is indeed a privatized status, but in a different way to how women were historically 
um, relegated um, to what, in, from a liberal perspective, um, could be called the, the private sphere. Um, indeed, there's a lot of uh, feminist uh, analysis uh, um, of previous generations of feminism of the private versus public uh, uh, divide. But in feminist accounts, part of the criticism of the private slash uh, public uh, spheres is about how the private sphere was a sphere of non-intervention from the state. So the state just relegated the power to the men uh, within the household and so forth. And women's issues within that sphere were issues that didn't deserve or didn't warrant sufficient state protection. Um, that's part of the criticism. Now, when we talk about children, uh, especially increasingly over history, that hasn't been the case. So children are indeed confined in many senses to the, the private sphere, but at the same time, there is a lot of state intervention into that private sphere in the name of child protection, which didn't exist to the same extent historically in relation to women, uh, because child protection has evolved into something which is far more developed than women's protection historically was. So that speaks to one of the themes uh, that I touch on in my video, which is the theme of fluidity. Part of the fluidity of child law and child rights is that on the other hand, they enshrined parental autonomy, which is all about non-intervention by the state into the family. But at the same time, they also enshrined state interference in cases of, for example, neglect for parents uh, and so forth. And we know historically and still to this day that so-called neglectful parents tend to be parents who are from lower socioeconomic classes or um, racialized minorities or single parents, uh, household, non-citizens and so forth. So there are disempowered groups that tend to be targeted uh, by that fluidity uh, of the law. So all of that means that the uh, sphere of or status of childhood um, presents different problems to what um, the private public divide uh, presented uh, in in within feminism. And in the context of children, I think a key problem is not the fact that there isn't enough protection of children, but rather that protection tends to be conceptualized in an uncritical way. Um, and, and to answer your question, I think critical childhood studies can advance our thinking about, about this issue by rethinking age norms, rethinking, drawing on historical studies of childhood, anthropological studies of childhood, sociological and others, questioning the supposed, uh, supposedly natural and universal um, uh, essence of uh, these age norms that contemporary uh, legal uh, mechanisms are based on. And then critical legal scholarship can advance our thinking by rethinking legal norms, because a key element of critical legal scholarship is uh, highlighting the, the violence of the law. So combined, what all of that can do is, in a sense, lay bare the violence of child protection, right? So the privatized status of childhood is not necessarily in tension with, but is uh, operates in tandem with child protection, which is quite often violent. And that's something that I've tried to uh, explore from various uh, uh, perspectives in my own work. Uh, for example, my latest book on Israel-Palestine, one of my key arguments there challenges the, the common um, narrative that Israel simply robs Palestinians of their childhood and that Israel disregards international legal norms of child protection. And what I show in the book is that actually Palestinians are not robbed of their childhood, which is a very essentialistic and sentimental and context and insensitive narrative. Rather, they are subjected to a legal model of childhood. And Israel does that um, by invoking international legal norms of child protection in ways that are actually detrimental to Palestinians. So rather than ignoring um, human rights and, and the language of uh, child protection, Israel incorporates uh, international legal norms of child protection into its 
uh, practices through a series of reforms that actually work uh, uh, to the detriment of uh, both Palestinian uh, children and adults. Um, and all of that also calls into question assumptions about normal what's a normal activity or a site for children, right? There's a lot of activism and scholarship, for example, around children's work, um, showing how many children who are involved in work to this day want to have the right to a dignified uh, uh, work, don't find it as necessarily something that um, cannot coexist with valuable education um, and so forth. Um, and, and then maybe to, to uh, finish with, with addressing the, the final uh, element of your question, in terms of thinking about some alternatives to, to the privatized status of uh, uh, childhood, first of all, I, I would say there's not necessarily any single alternative because there are different ways of being critical. When we think about critical legal theory and critical uh, uh, childhood studies, in the video uh, uh, where I present these ideas is based on a certain chapter. In, and in that chapter, I suggest that my framing of uh, critical childhood uh, studies and critical uh, legal scholarship is one where critical, being critical is about calling into question the concepts, um, the fundamental concepts underlying legality in childhood. So being uh, calling into question the concept of law itself, legality, and the concept of childhood itself. That's one way of being critical, which can be quite radical. Uh, and that's what the video uh, um, focuses on. But there, there are also different ways of being critical of those concepts. I think also the question of thinking of alternatives to the privatized status of childhood needs to be very context dependent. It needs to be sensitive to different contexts, which is something that law doesn't do well. Law is not great with the context necessarily because it's all about norms, which can be quite abstract. And also childhood doesn't necessarily do well as a social construct because that is another form of abstract abstraction. Um, and there could be perhaps some tensions between different studies or within critical childhood studies and critical legal scholarship, but these tensions are not necessary. Um, they depend on, again, how we are critical and how we approach each of these uh, issues. So uh, my answer in, in this sense is quite open-ended and non-specific because I wouldn't want to be overly prescriptive um, and kind of obstructing the, the possibility of context sensitivity. Thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting the the kind of the particular vision of of being critical that that you draw out of both of these traditions. I mean, I think it would even be possible to genealogically go back and say like they emerge from a similar kind of moment in time and maybe even scholarly moment in time. You know, in terms of like the social history of you know the sixties and seventies, um, at least in the kind of American tradition of critical legal studies. You know, they're heavily reading E.P. Thompson and, you know, scholars of childhood, um, very influenced by this kind of effort to destabilize and denaturalize these the social categories that becomes prominent in, in that field. So in a sense, like what we're trying to do is bring them back together. Um, so I think I want to I want to transition and, and ask you about some of the, you know, forward looking implications that, that come up in your talk um, and, you know, specifically about about ageism and its role in the legal order. So in your talk, you point out that, that you know, the goal of pushing inquiry in this direction is ultimately to develop our political imagination of, quote, what society could look like under a less ageist legal order. Could you say more about how ageism shapes, legitimizes, and intersects with other forms of socio-legal oppression? Um, and you know, what could a less ageist legal order look like? Yes, certainly. I, I'll just say I'm I'm tempted to also say in relation to your comment earlier about some of the historical trajectories of both uh, childhood critical childhood studies and critical uh, legal theory. And you mentioned the uh, civil rights uh, uh, movement in the '60s. Uh, it's quite interesting that Margaret Mead and uh, Philippe Ries, 
are often mentioned as two of the founding father, uh, parents rather um, of, of childhood studies. And both of them, uh, interestingly, Margaret Mead was uh, kind of a hero of sorts uh, for many in the civil rights movement uh, in the 60s because she, her uh, anthropological or ethnographic study of childhood in Samoa uh, in, in the social construct, uh, constructedness um, of childhood symbolized for many people how society can be uh, reimagined uh, radically. And equally, thinking about Philippe Ariès, the, the French historian, we see his work figuring quite pro prominently in the works, for example, of Sulamit Firestone, the radical feminist in the 70s. So certainly, I think there's a lot to what you talk about, kind of the co-alignment of these historical trajectories. Uh, now, in answer to your uh, question about uh, ageism, um, so certainly in terms of intersectionality, ageism does, uh, of course, intersect with other forms of, uh, uh, we could call it oppression or bias or uh, essentialism, perhaps. Uh, one that comes to mind um, is um, men in trouble with the law. Um, in, in a recent uh, article, I, I analyzed how campaigns, especially in the US and in the UK, uh, over the past couple of decades, to uh, decrease the imprisonment of children, often endorse the imprisonment of adults, either implicitly or explicitly in some cases. Uh, they single out children as deserving of greater uh, leniency. Um, and in the process, they say or imply that adults actually do deserve uh, punishment, including incarceration. Now, we know that the vast majority of uh, people in prisons around the world tends to be men. So there's um, um, an intersection there between uh, ageism and one could argue sexism, because this is a form of sexism that is leveled at men. Um, and quite often, men behind bars tend to be, again, members of those disempowered groups that I mentioned earlier, right? In the US, for example, disproportionately non-white men, uh, and in other countries uh, as well, uh, the same issue, as well as uh, uh, working class or lower socioeconomic uh, uh, classes, uh, um, non-citizens, uh, and so forth. Um, Another example in context of war or military occupation, which I've written on and, and others have as well, is the intersection of ageism with sexism and racism. Uh, quite often in context of humanitarian crises uh, like this, we have this trope of women and children, women and children. Women and children need to be singled out because they are uh, the quintessential um, um, emblems of vulnerability. And what that tends to do is legitimize state violence towards uh, adult men. Quite often, these adult men to be Muslim. We've seen that in US wars around the world, uh, some of which the UK has been involved in. And we see that in Israel, Palestine, which is another context that I mentioned earlier. One of the problems with that, um, in addition to some of the obvious ones, is that actually in some respects, adult men are actually more vulnerable to state violence than women and children. Um, for example, um, um, forced recruitment into military service, that's something that they tend to be targeted uh, for more, arbitrary arrest, uh, and so forth. Um, so what that does is it indicates that the lives of adult men are undeserving of our solidarity and sympathy. And all of that is related to certain norms about uh, around child protection. So that those are a couple of examples uh, about how ageism intersects with other um, practices, social practices and attitudes. Now, you, you pose a very challenging question in terms of what could a less, less ageist uh, society look like? I think one way of maybe answering that question is by looking at societies that already exist or that have existed historically, that existed historically and learning from them. Because 
we do have actually certain social spheres or practices that are less less ageist that don't abide by the growing uh, demand uh, for society to be age homogenous. Uh, one instance of, of, of that, which I've uh, explored in several of my publications, is intergenerational relations or intergenerational solidarity, especially in a political sense. Um, so I'll just mention a couple of uh, examples that I've uh, uh, touched on, uh, because both, both of them um, have the potential of maybe signaling also what a less age, less age society could look like. Um, so, so one instance um, is uh, indigenous child removal uh, in the U.S., in Canada, in Australia, in China, and in many other uh, places uh, uh, throughout history. Um, as many of our viewers may know, there have been uh, cases of systematic removal of indigenous or ethnic minority children from their parents and communities, and often that was done because the parents and communities were perceived or depicted as being a bad influence on those children. Now, the attempt essentially was to sever intergenerational ties within those communities, because the, inter the, the, the prospect of intergenerational continuity, culturally, politically, and, and otherwise, was seen as a threat to dominant norms. Um, so the practice that was curtailed, the practice of intergenerational uh, relationality in and of itself signals uh, has a certain potential uh, uh, here, I think, politically and socially. Uh, a, re a very related uh, instance, uh, which is also about a settler colonial society, comes from Palestine, which, as I mentioned, uh, I've written on extensively. Um, one of the uh, uh, settings that I... Uh, examined in, in several of my publications is um, Israel's imprisonment of uh, Palestinian political prisoners, uh, both children and uh, adults. In the past, Palestinian children and adults were uh, incarcerated mostly together, and they formed many uh, intergenerational uh, uh, practices to transfer political knowledge from one generation to another, and that was seen as dangerous by uh, the Israeli authorities. Um, and what that ha then happened is that Israel increasingly started separating uh, Palestinian children uh, from adults. And it actually did that in reference to the Convention on the Rights of the Child and other international legal instruments of child rights, which do indeed require uh, the separation of children from adults in, in prisons uh, um, with very um, narrow exceptions. Um, so I think what we can learn from these examples is both about the uh, pitfalls, perhaps, of dominant norms of child protection uh, and some of the issues we touched on earlier about context insensitivity and so forth, but also if we look at um, what um, forms of resistance Palestinians and, and uh, um, Native Americans and uh, First Nations in Canada uh, and, and uh, Aboriginals in Australia and others uh, have been engaged in, we can see those as uh, maybe a source of inspiration of what a less ageist society could look like. But I'm sure there are many other examples one could think of. Thank you. Um, and, you know, thank you for, for all of your thoughts about how, you know, we can draw these, these fields more closely together. I think, um, you know, as your, your talk and this conversation has shown, there are a lot of opportunities for you know for for critical legal theory and critical child studies to draw on each other, um, you know to get at the contingency of these social categories and how the law mobilizes them, and you know how to build a, a more just future as well um, by looking to other examples. Um, so thank you for for all of these thoughts. It's been a real real pleasure to talk with you today about them. Thank you. Thank you for all the fantastic questions. <laughs>